Onk Live Insights is a video editorial program produced by Onk Live. With regards to the different 5-HT3 receptor antagonists, there are four main drugs that are available in the United States and being used on Dancitron, Granisetron, Dilocitron, and Palinocitron. The first three of these drugs are basically first-generation 5-HT3 receptor antagonists, and they're quite similar to each other. The palinocitron, interestingly the name palinocitron came because it was discovered in Palo Alto, uh, but palinocitron has a higher binding efficiency and a longer half-life than do the other three drugs. So it appears to be a better 5-HT3 receptor antagonist. There are now a number of different NK1 receptor antagonists. A prepotent was the first one that came available. It was uh, or available as an oral agent given for three days, a higher dose on the first day, and then lower doses on day two and three. Subsequent to that became available fosaprepotent, which is an IV formulation, only has to be given on the first day of therapy. Uh, a lot of things changed because you only had to give it IV one day versus giving three days of the other. But something became apparent after the drug was available, and that was that it caused a fair amount of venous toxicity especially in patients who had been receiving adromycin. So in our practice, we've actually eliminated fosaprepotent for patients who are getting adromycin-based chemotherapy because of the venous toxicity. More recently, natupotent is another 5-HT3 receptor antagonist which has become available. It's an oral agent. It's only available in a compound called NEPA, N-E-P-A, which stands for neptupotent and palinocitron, so the most effective of the different uh, 5-HT3 receptor antagonists. Uh, this NEPA in this palinocitron in this formulation is given orally, as opposed to palinocitron that's given alone is given intravenously. Most recently, rolopatin has become available. It's another oral preparation given on day one, uh, and that's now FDA approved in the last month or so. Yeah, so we've been using steroids uh, for nausea for years. Um, and it's actually our, uh, our drug that we give frequently for patients who are receiving low uh, or moderately emetogenic chemotherapy. Doses of steroids uh, range, uh, but we typically use dexamethasone given its low glucocorticoid, uh, I'm sorry, given its low mineralocorticoid uh, activity. Um, as a single dose, and, and doses range from 8 up to 20 milligrams. Steroids can also be given on subsequent days, uh, such as days 2 through 4 after receiving chemotherapy. And added benefits are it usually increases appetite, uh, overall well-being, uh, but again, uh, given the myriad of side effects associated with long-term use, we don't uh, use glucocorticoids long term. In discussing benzodiazepines and their role in CINV, they have a very unique niche in terms of uh, anticipatory nausea. Anticipatory nausea is when you have had a bad experience uh, with nausea and as a result you are hardwired to avoid that stimuli so when patients are anticipating a bad experience because of a, hi a history of a bad experience, we tend to use benzodiazepines. Um, of the benzodiazepines, I think lorazepam is probably uh, one of the safest um, given its half-life and uh, metabolic profile. Um, and I typically will give a low dose, say 0.5 milligrams or up to one milligrams uh, as needed. Um, other medications that uh, have been of incredible importance um, include some of our dopamine antagonists. So actually there's a body of literature to support the use of haloperidol uh, for patients that have uh, nausea at low doses. And then the most recent is uh, olanzapine. So olanzapine or Zyprexa, I teach our residents and fellows, is a promiscuous drug. And by introducing the word promiscuity, they seem to remember it because it hits multiple serotonin receptors and mul multiple dopamine receptors. And in this 
promiscuity, it somehow has increased activity over our traditional dopamine uh, antagonists. And uh, Rudy Navari out of Indiana has done a lot of studies looking at its use uh, with low doses, not only for the prophylaxis of chemotherapy-induced nausea and vomiting, but its treatment once it's there. The last uh, class that um, folks are very interested in are the cannabinoids. Um, given my home state of Colorado, uh, this has been, been a, uh, in the news all the time. Um, but as, as we know, there's multiple states now legalizing the use of medicinal marijuana. Patients um, frequently are already using it without telling their providers. And so um, I, as an oncologist and palliative care doc, will engage my patients and make sure I ask them about the use of uh, medicinal marijuana just because I want to know about its interactions with other drugs I'm giving them. Uh, in general, um, we discourage the use of inhaling any form of marijuana, especially for patients that are neutropenic. Um, so if they are going to pursue this as an option, um, the preferred route would be oral. Of course, this leads to all sorts of in, uh, interesting issues as there's no uh, product that's med medically regulated uh, outside of Marinol that's currently available. Uh, Marinol has been used for nausea. It's also called dronabinol. Uh, the challenges that I've had with its use in chemotherapy-induced nausea and vomiting is that it's synthetic THC. And really, the medical benefits of the cannabinoids uh, are usually outside the THC. So that's, THC is associated with uh, the euphoria of medicinal marijuana or, or marijuana in general, and where we really want to maximize cannabinoid receptors, which are um, numerous. So um, again, uh, it's not something I'm, uh, I routinely prescribe. Uh, it's something that they would have to engage in a dispensary uh, to get. And then, there, of course, there's no regulation on, um, on the actual product to guarantee the product.